Upon her long overdue return to the land of her birth, Mary Stewart found herself in a religious and political quagmire. She was in a precarious situation indeed, so it was essential that she quickly find alliances who offered her some protection and access to resources. Perhaps this was one of the reasons why she chose to marry her cousin, Henry Stewart, Lord Darnley. Family and all that stuff. To more fully appreciate that thought, let's pay a little visit to Reformation Scotland in the summer of 1560 to see what she was up against in the religious and political worlds that characterized Reformation Scotland. I hope you'll join me. The ecclesiastical or church dissensions that marked the latter half of the 17th century were certainly not unique in the history of Reformation Scotland. While some participants arguably saw the Reformation and its lingering effects as positive change, others were no doubt disappointed by the persistence of social and political tensions inherent in any event designed to reform traditions and the distribution of power in social relationships. The Scottish Reformation was a schismatic action against the old alliance with France and the Pope. In comparing the Scottish Reformation to those of other countries, including England, David Stevenson writes that, and I quote, among the latter was the Reformed Church of Scotland, born not by royal decree, but through armed rebellion, though no shots were fired, against Catholic or royal authority, end of quote. It was ignited by the return to Scotland of John Knox, the former understudy of the martyred George Wishart. After serving time in French confinement for his part in the seizing of the home of Archbishop Beaton of St. Andrews, who was murdered by Protestant usurpers, Knox had spent time as a minister in England, but was forced into exile at Geneva because of the ascendancy of the staunch Roman Catholic Mary Tudor. You might know her nickname, Bloody Mary. Knox spent much of his time in exile absorbing the teachings of John Calvin and his colleagues who were establishing the Genevan Academy that would later become the University of Geneva. Armed with Old Testament covenantal legalism and the Calvinist expression of Protestantism, Knox came home on May 2, 1559. He went to Dundee where he met a crowd of supporters. He was then declared an outlaw by Queen Regent Mary Stuart's mother. She also ordered Protestant leaders to convene in Stirling. Instead, nine days later, Knox and a growing crowd paid a visit to St. John's Kirk in Perth. Once he was behind the pulpit, he launched into a verbal condemnation of Scottish Kirk and the papacy. His fiery oratory against idolatry and the evils of popery led to the overthrow of the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland. Mobs gutted the Kirk and then did the same to Blackfriars and Greyfriars abbeys. Though the Reformation of the Kirk had begun, it was not complete. The settlement of policy issues that plagued the Kirk throughout much of the plantation era was not finally made until 1690 when Presbyterianism became the official polity of church governance in Scotland. However, its establishment did not stop thousands of Scots families from migrating to Ulster, nor did the Presbyterian settlement stop dissension within the Kirk. Over the next century and a half, schism upon schism struck the Church of Scotland. The Kirk's offspring and Ulster likewise split time and time again. The doctrinal schisms produced a cultural and social setting in which a young, staunchly Roman Catholic queen dealt with one upheaval after another. Here's another issue that we often overlook, and that was land ownership. With Protestantism, nobles were granted church-owned lands. They were not about to return them to the Pope, that's for sure. The, Coke as, the Kirk, as it was conceived by members of the Scottish ecclesiastical intelligentsia, was Christ's manifest body in the sanctified lands occupied by Scots, and to them, they were destined to play a clear geotheological part in sacred history. Such an ambitious, lofty objective required an equally soaring statement of faith to guide the Scots, who would in turn guide the Kirks of other nations into a closer and abiding relationship with their Creator and Redeemer. After pondering the fabric of true religion, John Knox and five other Johns took only four days to write and edit the Scots Confession. It was approved in 1560 by the Scottish Parliament as containing, and I quote, doctrine grounded upon the invaluable word of God. End of quote. Knox was keen to identify Scotland with the true visible church as exemplified by Calvin's Geneva, which he referred to as the most perfect school of life that was ever on earth since the days of the apostles. 
The Scots Confession was the Kirk Statement of Faith until it was replaced by the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1647. But its acceptance among parishioners was not slow indeed. When Mary arrived in Scotland in 1561, she was already deeply schooled in Catholicism, and she was still in her teens. Despite the presence of her mother, Mary of Guise, the Queen Regent, the Scottish Parliament acted alone without the input from her. The Scots Confession, which they approved, had nonetheless served as a basis for doctrines for nearly 90 years, laying the foundation for a national, anti-tyrannical religious ethos that established deep, pervasive roots in the lowland culture. Its doctrines provided the theological anchor for the National Covenant, which led to the British Civil War. It had survived the polity strife that characterized the relationship between Andrew Melville and James VI, and it was used by John Craig as a statement of faith on which he based the drafting of the King's Confession, that's the Negative Confession, that was signed by James Stewart in 1580. The Scots Confession embraced the concept of unilateral covenants or diathecy, whereas its replacement, the Westminster Confession, was based more on the quid pro quo premise of English contract law, which church historian James B. Torrance calls federal Calvinism. In terms of polity, it reflected a compromise between the various orientations of those who attended the assembly. Included at the assembly were ministers with Erastian views such as John Lightfoot, divines from the Melvillian Presbyterian Two Kingdoms camp, and separatists otherwise known as Congregationalists. There were no Catholics invited. Their perspectives on polity among those divines could well be plotted on continuums from theocratic to Erastian and autocratic to democratic. Moreover, the Westminster Confession was a statement of faith based on moderate Calvinism, yet bilateral aspects of its doctrinal points, along with its clear position on predestination, still made it a stronger Calvinist statement of faith than a Scots Confession. For Roman Catholics like the 19-year-old Mary, Queen of Scots, the theological and political landscape of Scotland and England too, for that matter, was, after 1560, full of dangerous and even life-threatening pitfalls. Deep theological points aside, Kirk authorities frowned on rituals and traditions. Churches were stripped of their stations of the cross, icons, and statues. Recited prayers like the rosary were also frowned upon after 1560. To the reformers, the Pope was considered an agent of Satan, so any object, object or ritual that smacked the papacy was thrown on the waste heap. Christianity in France, on the other hand, was still bright and colorful with holy water, incense, and statuary to help a largely illiterate population understand the message delivered in Latin-based homilies or sermons. Scotland, on the other hand, was also the home to a people who were likewise barely literate. Knox and his colleagues set about to replace Catholic clergy with ministers who were capable of teaching congregants how to read. After all, the Bible's a written text, right? The Scottish minister, Robert Blair, who served on both sides of the Irish Sea, claimed to have provided destruction to as many as 1,200 people at one time, not in one day, of course. Henceforth, education was now considered a priority in the Church of Scotland. John Knox actually worked well with Mary on several occasions, especially in helping to salvage her half-sister's marriage to Archibald Campbell, a leading Protestant noble. Unfortunately, they later on divorced. In other instances, he relied on stereotypical images of the queen that he had created himself through his own interactions with Bloody Mary, Mary of Guise, and now Mary Stuart. He was certain that she was like the others and that she would jump at the first chance to reassert Roman Catholicism in Scotland. According to Jane Dawson, a professor at the University of Edinburgh, Knox does not deserve the label of a complete misogynist. He did, however, think that she would fail. In our next episode, part three, we'll pick up with some of the decisions that Mary made that led to her downfall. I hope you'll join me. In the meantime, God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.